This is an SM Media production. Hi folks and welcome to the latest episode of Chronicle, the Rangers Journey. I'm Scott McPike, it's an absolute pleasure to be your host as always. We are now at episode four, we are going to take a look at 1991 to 1995 when Walter Smith takes over from Graham Sunnis, builds his own team, a near miss with European greatness, signing one of the top players in European football and domestic dominance, plus also we will take a look at David Murray and how he handled the media to join me on this part of the journey. Well-renowned journalist and author, Ian King. Ian, it is an absolute pleasure to have your company for this episode. I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, great to be on, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. We will start the this part of the journey by going to the summer of 1991. Where are we in the journey? Graham Sunnis is at Liverpool. He had obviously left four games before the end of the last season. Walter Smith come in, Walter Smith wins the title, it was tight but it came down to the last day against Aberdeen and this summer Ian it's fair to say it is all about looking forward to the new potential rule, the three foreigner rule of 1991-92 comes into place, Walter Smith has to kind of rip the rip the revolution apart and obviously the, the market of going into England over the past few years that kind of has to stop at this stage doesn't it? Yeah, it did. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at um, that rule, obviously, it's what brought Andy Gorham to Rangers. It's what brought Stuart McCall to Rangers. You know, lots of great signings. Uh, but but Scottish players were, were all of a sudden very important. Otherwise, I honestly don't think they would have moved Chris Woods on. Mm-hmm. Players like, like Spackman would hang around and stuff like that. But, uh, no, it's intriguing. You know, it's intriguing when you look at that. But he was also a very... He was a pragmatic guy, Walter, uh, and I think he looked upon the particularly the goalkeeping slot as a waste of a foreigner. You know, he wanted more cre- creativity. If he was only going to have three foreigners, then he wanted them further forward in the field. So uh, it's inter- interesting now when you look at the makeup of the squad that made the Europa League final to think of the the restrictions that were on yeah. that were on Walter at that time. I mean, it's we're, we're at the stage in 1991. Cultures changing, football's changing. We're we're going into the We'll talk a bit about the formation of the Champions League in a couple of minutes. But when you look at that transfer window, the the kind of ones that stick out, obviously Chris Woods and Mark Walters, two symbols of that soonest revolution. Obviously, Woods was one of the ones that kicked it off. But you're going into a Scottish market. Andy Gorham will touch on the goalie in a, a minute. I know you will we'll obviously talk about his whole career at, at the club. Chris selling Chris Woods for pretty much a, not even a loss and then bringing in Andy Gorham it's got to be up there one of the best business, bits of business friends I've ever done Yeah it was you know and I think when you look at it like for a million quid uh, you know Gorham and Stuart McCall you know I think Stuart McCall was 1.2 and, Yeah uh, you know you look at those two signings uh, terrific signings you know and um, I mean the goalie would only have whatever it was over 250 games 10, 11 medals McCall was a mainstay. They were, they were they were both mainstays of what would become the nine in a row era. Mm-hmm. Uh, fantastic signings, and um, but I just remember at the time, you know, I, I think a lot of the you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't have been getting told it was a bargain for the first three or four weeks. Andy Gorham being there, but <laughs> 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 one of those they had one of those starts that some that players sometimes have at Rangers, and it's always interesting when you when you equate it back to this era to watch. I watched the game yesterday to watch the, the Tom Lawrences and Malik Tillman and people like that making their debuts and and you think how important it was and then look back and think someone who went on to become a legend really had a an absolutely horrific start at the club uh, with the Gorham in his first you know five six weeks but interestingly reflect on that part of it. yeah absolutely as well another thing I want to touch on that we've had on we've we've interviewed and we spoke about this as well getting David Robertson for Aberdeen one of a a top left back obviously. I think it was a position Sunis had wanted to fill for years. I don't think he ever really as good as Stuart Monroe was. I don't think he ever kind of fully trusted him. And I think it was obviously that was another big one. Like you're going to Aberdeen, you're 
you're bright. Obviously, I don't think Aberdeen were keen to sell at that point, and but getting David Robertson in as well, it's another big bit of business. Robertson was honestly, when I look now at Andy Robertson, you know, David Robertson was miles ahead of his time. You know, like at that, in that position, you know, like you look at uh, the numbers that the. Liverpool have had from Alexander Arnold and Robertson, and then you look at the Rangers comparison from the amount of times you see Barisic, you know, powering up the left or Bassey last season, and 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 Tavernier scoring back post, and the, how how high and brave the fullbacks are now. Robertson was an absolute Rolls Royce, like mm-hmm. an unbelievable player. And and you're right, I think when you look at that that left back, I can remember, you know, even going back to Jan Bartram, Jimmy Phillips. You know, Chris Vinicom. Yeah. There, there, there was a stack of players in that in that slot, and until Bomber came in, actually, you know, and Bomber played the uh, left back as well for a while, uh, as well as left centre half. You know, I think when you look at like uh, Robertson was like an absolute Rolls Royce, you know, and, and very underrated. It's actually there's not that many of them out of that team that went on to be have great coaching journeys, but David Robertson's had a terrific coaching journey. Yeah, from, unbelievable. You know, San Diego, Real, Cashmere. You know, he's a brilliant like. Uh, He's had a fascinating life after nine in a row. Yeah, absolutely. A, a departure I want to touch on in this episode is the the departure of Trevor Stephen to Marseille. Obviously, that five and a half million, that's crazy money back then. But you've got two very similar negotiators, it's fair to say, with David Murray and Bernard Tappe. Is that accurate? Like, you can imagine how yeah. that negotiating went. Oh, that would have that would have been uh, the egos have landed, wouldn't it? That yes. one, you know, like, you know, that's that's two guys who like don't like to be second in a negotiation. You know, I don't think uh, it it comes in as a negotiation. There, it's just they, somebody wants to win and somebody wants to lose. You know that, and uh, it was a good deal at the time. You know, obviously I ended up coming back, but like um, he was a he was a clever clever footballer, Trev. Uh, and I always always remember his, his nickname in the dressing room was Tricky. Mm-hmm. You know, and they all called him Tricky Trev, you know, just because he he had like he's just a clever footballer, really. And I always thought like another one who I thought took it up a level, you know, yeah. when when he was brought in. Uh, a class act. And I also a class act as a person off the field as well, doing a yeah, lot of work absolutely. mental health and stuff like that, which which I think is pretty admirable as well. He's a good guy. Yeah, absolutely. But we'll we'll talk about the kind of how European football is going to change at this point. We've got the three foreigners rule, but we've also got the formation of what's going to become the Champions League. It kind of starts in ninety one, ninety two, where the the European Cup is going to no longer be kind of a fully knockout thing because you've got the situation where back in the day the champions of Italy could play the champions of Spain in the first round, but you could also have the thing where the champions of Malta could play the champions of Northern Ireland. So it was one of it was something that needed to happen. It was obviously, it was better for revenue to go down the group stage route and Rangers, Campbell, logo in particular, had a kind of big hand in it. Yeah, he did. And uh, again, someone who I feel when you look back, I always thought he carried himself magnificently. You know, like a, a really astute guy. And Campbell was one of those guys, like you, you would see the people who, charlatans really, who came into the club later in the, in the bleak years that Rangers had. Campbell, logo just uh, for me, was, he was class to deal with, first of all, as a person, as a journalist. And he was also just, I thought he he gave the club the right the right image across across Europe, not just in, you know, he was heavily involved at UEFA level uh, and, and heavily involved in, in, in the formation of the Champions League. And I just remember the excitement of that that season, you know, like, like and uh, the games were, the games were unbelievable. We probably touched on the, on the section games and how well they played, you know, yeah. and it's just, uh, I think, a reflection of, how shrewd Smith was as a coach when you look at the, you know, that team going when, you know, a bounce of the ball, really, uh, of the final. And um, and then I'm finally getting to a UEFA Cup final where a team that was nowhere near uh, that squad yeah. in terms of ability, you know. So for, so I always think that for all the plaudits he got, you know, Walter, I think um, he did get under, underestimated a little bit in his, in his European knowledge when, because people forget how close they went to the final in 92 in, in 93. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the first kind of Smith, the first year of the Smith era, the, a defeat to Sparta Prague and away goals, was that Sparta Prague going to do really well in that kind of the, the last year of the European Cup? But was what was the kind of reaction to that back at the time, looking at a defeat to Sparta Prague? I think, to be honest, it was, uh, it was the heat getting ramped up again on the goalie. Because he, he was at fault again in the Ibrox leg, uh, and he'd already, you know, 
I remember him telling me about the, the horrible one at, at Tyne Castle where Scott Crabb shot and he thought it was yeah. going past the post and he actually made a gesture that's going wide. And then he said, I heard this swish behind me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, it went in. He then get, and I think, uh, I can't remember the exact chrono- chronology, Scott, but like, he then lost a horrible goal at Hamden in the League Cup semi final against Hibs, mm-hmm. having left Hibs and said he was leaving Hibs to win medals. And uh, I just remember at that point, you know, like, Coisty tell me that he walked into the dressing room and said, you know, after the, after that fight of the semi final, he said, um, walked into the Rangers dressing room and said, you know, just think about it. If I was at Hibs, I'd have a League Cup medal uh, after the final. And Coisty, as quick as, as Coisty has said, listen, if you were still at Hibs, we'd all have a League Cup medal. <laughs> so, <laughs> he slaughtered them. And, uh, and then I, I, there was a, it was a kind of one goal, I think, that, you know, the goal in the, I think it came off. Might have come off Nizzy or something, but there was a he let in another one. It was the third high profile error he'd made against Sparta Prague. And I just remember that game being a kind of culmination of oof, this goal is he's no this goal is no Chris Woods, you know, this guy's mm-hmm. going to struggle here. And his next game after that was actually Celtic away. Uh, and he had a clean sheet at Parkhead, they won two 0 and I think that made him, you know, yeah, like, yeah. I never looked back. But the, for the Sparta Prague one, I remember that, like you say, they were a they were a class act. Uh, but it was an early exit and and disappointing, you know. Like like you know, probably equate it with the kind of feeling that there was in the the Malmo Stephen Gerrard game, you know, where you, you were thinking that the club were on a you know on the precipice of something you know big, yeah. and then it was incredibly early, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But what well, you mentioned, obviously, the goal, and we'll touch on him. Then now, obviously, we're recording this a couple of weeks after he, he tragically passed away, but. He does turn it round. He has that magnificent game at Parkhead, and he he just kicks on so much. And what was it? What like? What, what do you remember him saying about what was it that just changed? Like, was it just that performance kind of built the confidence in him? Because Rangers go on a magnificent run after that, and it it kind of goes with as well with just how well he, he takes over at that point. I think a superb piece of like man management because rather than uh, rather than leave him twisting in the wind, Walter brought him in, and he said, "What can we do to help you?" You know, what can we do? Tell me what I need to do to help you. I need to help you settle in here. You, you know, obviously, you know, you're not performing at the peak that you can be at. And he asked him to get Alan Hodgkinson uh, mm-hmm. up to, uh, you know, specialist goalkeeping sessions with him. And Hodge at that minute was, was, remember, was working with Peter Schmeichel at Manchester United. So yeah. it takes a bit to go to Sir Alex and say, you know, I want your goalie coach to come up here two days a week and what we, what we go with him whilst also working down there with Schmeichel. But they got it done, you know, and a testimony of what was, you know, relationship with Sir Alex, obviously. And and that's what happened, you know. Hodg- Hodgkinson came up and eventually Hodgkinson would come up full time. Mm-hmm. They needed his kind of guru beside him to get him through it, you know, like to get yeah. him through the darker days. And then then he just kicked on. And after that, it was just... And people, like, I, I think people look at Andy and say, oh, the flying pig, and he wasn't an athlete and all that. He was an unbelievable athlete. Mm-hmm. Top level. You know, hand eye. You don't play cricket for Scotland and cricket, you know, and, and football for Scotland if you're if you're not a good athlete. And um, and after that, it was just one of those guys that he loved. You know, you see guys like I think Ibrox can make people up, can break them. You know, and like like it's such an unforgiving arena if you're not. You know, you don't get you hit the ground running. But he eventually like just loved it. You know, the big games when you see like I think he, I think it was something like five old firm games or twenty uh, twenty five or something. I can't remember some ridiculous start. He loved old firm games, you know, like, and then he loved all that, like, you know, mm-hmm. big games. And I think the ones I'll remember are Champions League, Le- Leeds away, stuff like that, and yeah. big and old firm games, you know. And it's just, uh, I was in touch with him up to the end, Scott, and mm-hmm. having done the book and all that kind of stuff in 50, it's no, no age, you know. It's Absolutely, actually. yeah. It's just a, a tragedy as well, and we're, we're sending our best to his family, but... You mentioned there about Wallers man management. It's something I want to touch on in the next part. We're going to talk about the the emergence of Ali McCoyst in this season. I think it's not run about enough. I just think that he turns it up a gear. Obviously, his relationship with Sunnis, I don't think was the best. I think that's probably fair to say, but he turns it up a gear. I mean, we remember, obviously, the, the nickname he got with, of the judge because he was the bench for so long. But what, ha- what clicked with him and Mark Gately this season? Because it just... When they start, when they when they were on it, they just weren't weren't like never come off. Unbelievable! I think when you you know he was definitely the third man when when Mo when Mo Johnson was there. You know, and to be honest, for a lot of that time, 
I don't think you could argue against that. And no, it's probably, probably not. Probably a view coming from a guy who, who comes from East Kilbride, you know, to speak about, to say that about Coisty, who's my, obviously I grew up with and stuff like that. But I think um, Mo Johnson, when he came back from Nantes, was probably one of the top strikers in Europe. Absolutely. You know, he developed into an unbelievable player. Uh, and it was a, a, for a lot of reasons, he was a brilliant signing, you know, like shattering the, you know, the Catholic signing. Uh, the high or uh, to bring in a high profile Catholic sign and all that, I think, built the, the future for the club mm-hmm. for a start. And it had to be someone who was of that level, you know, it had to be someone who was who could take the heat, which Mo could because of his personality, and also someone who could perform at a, an unbelievable level, which he did with Haley. And, and much as uh, McCoy is Rangers' greatest ever striker, and you can't, you can't argue with that, but at that mm-hmm. point, I don't think soon as made made a mistake in putting uh, Johnson and Haley together. But by the time the switch was made and, and Walter came in, I think Walter's so clever with the timing and the way that he, he basically motivated McCoy, you know, to, to take back the slot and eventually, and eventually he ended up, I know in, in my era when I was growing up, I, I just remember Toshak and Keegan at Liverpool. Mm-hmm. And I always think, you know, the reason that Haley's in Rangers' greatest ever team which you could definitely dispute, I think. It's the one slot you look at. Personally, I look at it and I think, should Derek Johnson have been mm-hmm. beside McCoy up front if, you, if you're looking at the greatest ever 11? You know, and Johnson was an unbelievable player in more than one position. And um, I think it's because people just cannot separate McCoy and Haley. Yeah. You look at it as a tandem, the same way as you look at Toshak and Keegan as a, as a, as a tandem. And the amount of times that the, the, that's... You wouldn't call it Route 1 because it was a brilliant tactic. The goalie called it the BFG. Mm-hmm. Called boot flick goal. And it was like, he would just literally look for Haley's head. It's like <laughs> half volley on Haley's head, flick on goal. And the amount of times that that worked, you know, and, and McCoy got in and scored. Uh, but they were just a perfect partnership, McCoy and Haley. Very different people, but a, a terrific partnership. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, McCoy goes on to win the, the European Golden Boot. He just has an unbelievable scoring record in that season. But... That whole season, obviously, apart from the kind of league, the league cup and the the European Cup exit, Rangers only lose one league game from November. It's just a how big was that title win? Because obviously, I think when you look back and we spoke about this last week when when Walter was appointed, I think there was that that kind of demand for a big name. How big was that title win to kind of improve the fans' kind of hopes that Walter was the right guy? Yeah, I think massive. You know, like uh, like obviously. Whatever way you look at it, soon as it left Rangers in the lurch, you know, he left April. You know, if you think about that now, that where the kind of, I wouldn't say there was a lot of vitriol towards Stephen Gerrard when he left, but people didn't like the time and miss mid season. Mm-hmm. Soon as it left in April, yeah. there was four big games left, you know, and he left for they left for Liverpool, and I think that always uh, left a sort of taste in a lot of mouths. But Waller got them over the line. But the next season, it's, it's really down to. Can you keep it going? You know, is it you know put your own mark on it? Can you win your own title? Uh, and they were they were relentless in the league. You know, like, like obviously they they go over the the first two kind of uh, you know the early start, which the goalie struggling. You know, they're out of Europe, the League Cup, but then after that they just kicked on and uh, and took command of it. And I think that was hugely important because it showed that he could do it on his own, you know, and for Walter and Archie as well, remember, yeah, you, know, absolutely. you know, it was massive for Walter and Archie together as a partnership to win the title in such commanding fashion. Yeah, and winning the Scottish Cup as well, the first one since 1990, eh, 1981, how how kind of big was that as well, beating Airdrie 2-1 in the final, because that was just a a bogey cup, Rangers just never did well in the Scottish Cup at that point. Yeah, it's funny is that's, that that's kind of repeated itself in the modern yeah. era, you know, look at it, you know, it has repeated itself, that kind of thing, they go through these droughts every now and again in the Scottish Cup, and then, uh, you know, I think that was massive, you know, it wasn't the greatest final in the world, you know, like, uh, you know, when I look at the final, to be honest, the goal I remember is Andy Smith's goal, so uh, yeah. it's, it's not like uh, <laughs> one of the memorable Rangers Scottish Cup final victories, but no, nah, to, to, to take two of, the, two of the three trophies, there was a point at the start of that season where that wouldn't have looked possible, you know, like, and, and they kicked on and, uh, and obviously I think that was probably the bedrock of the night, to be honest, winning it that season, uh, started to kick it on. Yeah, absolutely. And we move into the summer of 1992, not a lot of transfer business, Rangers obviously 
to bring back Trevor Stephen, I think there was some discrepancy with with P. Marseille. We'll touch on Marseille in a couple of minutes, but getting kind of getting into that summer, like we'll touch on the the, the new Champions League Rangers are drawn against Lingby. The champions are Denmark in the first round. Getting through that, and then obviously getting drawn against Leeds United. What was the obviously you were working in the media at the time? What was the what was going on at that time in the kind of media with your, your English counterparts? Oh, it was massive, you know. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about like, um, I remember the first the build up to the first game was unbelievable, you know. Like, and the, and the Lingby one wasn't an easy one to get past. I think mm-hmm. Gerani's in the, in the yeah, in the, in the Lingby, and, and even just getting through that, that that tie again, and I'm trying to kind of. Uh, for for younger listeners to to equate it, to, it looks a little bit like the Union Stad Gilwa one that the Rangers have now. You know that kind of there's a potential banana skin that Lingby one. You know, yeah. and then and then there was a lot of kind of I remember like there was a there was stuff around Stuttgart and stuff like that, and the, the, yeah. the draw was kind of messed up and stuff like that. And then and then obviously it became apparent that it was going to be Rangers versus Leeds at Battle of Britain. And I think you looked at you looked at the players they had: Strachan, McAllister, Cantona. You know, massive, right? You know, the, and I remember the first leg and the build up was just unbelievable. You know, we did eight page pullouts and things like that, which was pretty unheard of in one game, you know, building up yeah. to that game. And everything built up to the game and the, the noise was just unreal. Uh, I books that night and then within a minute, yeah. my pastors volleyed one into the top bin and, and the place just was like a pin in a balloon, right? And you're like, and you're just like, oh, but I think to summed up that team that. The character to come back, you know, and uh, and they weren't quality goals at Ibrox, you know, like my McCoyst and then look at obviously yeah. Granny always says he looked for the spot in his gloves and all that because he had <laughs> and then he punched it. Yeah, it's unknown goal, right? So it's like then they got two one up. But uh the away leg, you know, I remember like um I remember some of the stuff uh journalistically. From some of my colleagues down south, you know, the Rangers will get put, it was basically the Rangers will get put in their place in their way, like, yeah, well done, the plucky Scots type thing, and mm-hmm. all that, you know, and they'll get put in their place in their way, like, and obviously that there was no Rangers fans allowed in, but there was still so many, uh, so many great uh, Glasgow characters that made their way into that game, brilliant, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. James Moore, uh, you know, Andy Smiley, some of the, the Rangers super fans, they all made their way into the game somehow, but they all got there in the hospitality. Yeah. And um, terrific night, and it's always misremembered to me that night, Scott. To be honest, because people go on, yeah, they just went down, and it was another, you know, masterclass in a way, a way European football or whatever. They got absolutely battered that night. I think battered. it's a perfect. So I think it's a perfect simulation of this this team. What like you've got at one end, obviously, with the Haley Bolton McCoys for that header is that's yeah. that's a partnership. That's knowing yeah. each where each other are going to be, but. We mentioned the goalie. The sum of the saves he makes that night oh, are unbelievable. I can remember. I just remember, you know, Cantona going through on him. I don't know if you remember. It's one of the ones that comes out. He's so he makes himself so big. Yeah. Cantona's on his left foot, and he's and the goalie saves it. And I just remember Cantona looking at the goalie, and you can virtually look see him looking at him, going, "Who is this guy?" You know, it's just like <laughs> couldn't be him. And eventually, like I think Cantona got a consolation goal. Yeah, like, hits off Richard Goff's foot. Hits off his foot, right, and goes mm-hmm. in right. But, uh, and I remember the goal. Well, typically the goalie was raging because he had money on himself for a clean sheet. <laughs> there was a, there was a bit. Of, not like Andy to do that, but there was <laughs> there was a lot of like uh, Andy had been overlooked by Howard Wilkinson at the England Under Twenty Ones. And I remember the game he was picked to play for. People forget that picked to play for England Under Twenty Ones at Portsmouth, and they were struggling to sell tickets. And Howard Wilkinson picked a guy called Alan Knight. Because he was a local keeper for Portsmouth, and he put him ahead of the goalie, despite the fact that the goalie had been picked to play in the game to sell some tickets, and uh, and Andy was always raging about that. You know, even though he was proud of his Scottish heritage and proud that he got to play for Scotland, he held a little bit against Howard Wilkinson, and I just I just remember getting a message that night, you know, which was basically get it up, you held type <laughs> thing. He was really delighted that he was able to kind of put him out of Europe. Uh, so there was a bit of that about it, certainly, in, in the, the Battle of Britain, I think. Uh, scary now to look on, Scott, that's 30 years ago, scary. Yeah, I know. It was, uh, it was definitely, it, it's, to me, it looks like it's a seminal performance of the, the Smith era, you know, you look yeah. at that and go, wow, you know, like just too unbelievable for 
you know, to come back in the first game, pure Ibrox emotion, really, the first game, and then the second game, tactically, he did superbly. But as I say, people tend to forget how many brilliant saves uh, Gorham made that night and how good Goff and Brown were at the back. Goff yeah. and Brown were unbelievable that night, you know. Like, and, and they forget, you're playing against, as that was a peak Cantona, you know, that yeah. was Cantona on his way. And, uh, no, fantastic night. Yeah, Rangers are get drawn against the uh, the Russian champions CSK Moscow, the Belgian champions Club Bruges, and the French champions Marseille. What was their reaction to the draw at the time? Do you remember? I remember it being like um, obviously people looked at Marseille. I think as 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 the major danger. Didn't really much, know much about CSK and Bruges at that point, uh, but you know Marseille and Tappy's money meant that they were. You know, they had some fantastic players, you know, Boxage Faller, Abidi Pele. They were just like unbelievable. Sozi, they were like, you know, there was like, there was some team. Yeah. It was an unbelievable team and uh, had been put together for that purpose. They'd been put put together for the purpose with money. Kind of like a modern day PSG. Yeah, they lost in penalties a couple of years before as well. They were, I think yeah. they were desperate to win that. And... Yeah, they were put together for that purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of them because, and I think as much as it is now, Scott, you know, like, the French league, you're not going to go. You're not if you're a top level player, you're not going to France to win the league, mm-hmm. you know, because it's it's not like a great league competition, I don't think. And it's got better a little bit recently with the emergence of Lyon and Lille and clubs like that. But at that point, pretty much it was a given that Marseille were going to win it. So yeah. there was all the focus was in building them to win the European Cup, and that's why they were there. Yeah, the 25th of November 1992, Rangers host Marseille in the first game of the the yeah. Champions League group in the first 60 minutes. The French champions dominate two magnificent goals. You've got the wee mix up between the goalie and Stephen Presley, but Marseille were on on at that first sixty minutes. Unreal. I mean, I remember the night it was lashing down a rain as well, and uh, just got battered again, like battered. The first hour, you as actually men against boys. The first hour, you know, one of those ones where you're going, oh, you're looking, watching, and thinking they're out of depth here. Mm-hmm. There's no way they get a result here uh, for an hour, and then obviously. The, the thing with Elvis and the goalie, you know, Elvis was in obviously because of injuries. Uh, but I just remember something in the in the aftermath of that goal, you know, it would have been easy for the goalie to kind of blame Elvis or whatever. It was just a communications mixed up. They picked that the Elvis was flat in the turf and he picked him up. Mm-hmm. And it was a kind of roar went up for the fans, you know, I kind of come on Rangers like, you know, you can get back into this type thing. And you know, when you look at the the personnel that night because of those injuries and McSwegan was there and all that kind of stuff, you know, like you're like Unbelievable! They managed. I can remember walking out and thinking, "How is that two two? You know, it literally was. If it, if it was a boxing match, when they were match, they'd have stopped it. Yeah. No, well, they really would have. Really, Rangers on the ropes, getting an absolute bleaching, Scott. You know, <laughs> thinking that's that game over, and then somehow they managed to turn it around and get a point. Yeah. Haley scores. Haley scores a. I can. It's a two yard header, but McSwagan's yeah. header is actually a very underrated goal. It's just it's. Oh, it's a brilliant header. Brilliant yeah. header. But obviously, Rangers the level with Marseille after the first game. Rangers play at CSK Moscow in the second game. Do you remember where they played that game? Bochum. Bochum. Bochum, Germany. Is that right? Do you remember yeah. why? I can't remember, no. I, th- I can't remember why they, why it was switched there. But I remember it was in Bochum in Germany. I remember Ian Ferguson scored that, right? Ian Ferguson scored the winning goal. Rangers won one now. I think yeah. it was due to weather in Russia. I think it might well have been there was that it might well have been it was the depths of winter there and there was a frozen field or whatever and, and they went back there. But like I remember and again I think Ferdy's shot may have taken a deflection, but they they, they won one nil and uh big win, you know, and, and then obviously there's the, the two Bruges games mm-hmm. uh and Marseille away to come after that. Yeah, we'll it? touch we'll touch on the first Bruges game, the what the one one drop Peter Rooster, it's kind of late equaliser, but the second Bruges game it's it's an uphill battle because Haley gets sent off for I still I, I've I've watched it a few times a day. I don't know what he gets sent off for. He's sent off for a day. It's like so before that, you know, uh and touched on that in, in Andy's book, you know, the by then within the game, the stories were swirling around that, that Tappy was trying to make sure that Marseille won the tournament, you know, and that there was bribery and this and that and all that stuff. Was the story true about Haley getting approached by a Hundred percent. Is that true? That's a hundred percent. He was. He got a phone call, and was offered money to be injured, and basically not playing the game. And he's 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 always maintained 
since then that he feels someone got to the ref. Because when you look at it, and I remember the guy's name is Lorenzo Stalins, uh, the Bruce defender. And they were at each other all night, you know, and, mm-hmm. and Mark's kind of, you know, jerseys, whatever, and he kind of lifted his arm a wee bit and he straight redded him for an elbow. Uh, it was ridiculous, you know. And, and and when you look back now at that decision, you go, hang on a minute, you know, like, you know, you do you do question whether, you know, whether something was, was it that bad? He 100%, you know, like, and, and that was well known within, not at the time, it would have been great to know that at the time because we mm-hmm. sold a few papers, but after <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, when I did, uh, I did the goalie's book and and spoke to Mark about it. Yeah, they got a phone call saying, you know, you'll get a certain amount of money if you can, you know, if. And obviously, Mark spoke French from his his time at Monaco. Yeah, uh, yeah. He got that. He got an offer. He kind of basically be injured and not play. Then he, sure he, maybe they made sure he didn't play when you look back at. Mm-hmm. But obviously, that means he'll miss the game, the, the next game against Marseille. But Rangers get through that Bruges game. That Scott Nisbet goal that. Yeah. It's just unbelievable how it goes. But the game I wanted, obviously the Rangers are level with Marseille, but Marseille go to Moscow and win 6-0. What was mm-hmm. the reaction to that at the time? I think people thought that it stank, you know, a little bit. People even, thought then, it even then, look, even then, was yeah, people thought, yeah, absolutely. And as it turned out, you know, like uh, Rangers drew in Bruges and then the win, the win at Ibrox and then Obviously, Marseille away. Marseille away became a massive game. You know, when you when you look at it, and I always remember the chance that night. McCoy had an unbelievable chance at one one. It's also, by the way, one of the having done the first Rangers book that I did with any of the players was Ian Durant's autobiography in, mm-hmm. in nineteen ninety eight, and um, I just remember that night. I was right right behind when he struck it. Mm-hmm. What a goal that is! Honestly, I, I, again, yeah. like, look at Rangers' greatest goals like. It starts about a yard and a half outside the far post, going just mm-hmm. it's such an unbelievable strike. And I think the goalie always had a little bit of regret of the goal that he lost that night. Yeah, he Frank Sozzi. Frank Sozzi gets a hand on it and he feels he should. He always, I think he always felt he should have, he should have uh, saved that. And then people forget the chance McCoy missed. You know, if McCoy's yeah. missed a massive chance, he would normally score at 1 1. And um, you know, a 2 1 win there would have been, I don't know, I think they would have made the final when you look back on it. But mm-hmm. uh, but it was an unbelievable campaign, but but one that when you look back, they were subsequently found guilty of bribery and stuff like that. And it, it leaves a sort of taste, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously we we'll play a wee game of what if went in this part. If <laughs> if Rangers had if McCoy's had buried that chance and they'd went on to reach the final, do they beat AC Milan? In my view, yeah. Because it was a it was a it was an aging AC Milan side by that point, you know, uh as it was, you know, Bolly would go and score the goal and, and Marseille would win. It wasn't a great final when I looked at it. I just remember watching the final and, and like you're saying, playing a game of what if. Mm-hmm. But Rangers were on the rise then, you know, like and I think it's like uh, it's one of those ones. I, I think they I think they, they would have went on to win it. Mm-hmm. And you know, just there was that building of momentum on that run. They were getting better and better. They went through the section, obviously unbeaten, you know, and no, at that level, they were. I thought that was probably the year. But it's the legacy of that campaign. But I think, I think, like I say, that year, like that year, ninety two, ninety three. I think they went forty four games unbeaten in all in all competitions, uh, and they were just they did they looked invincible. And I, I think at that point, they started to build that that built nine for me because they started to build that era that kind of aura and invincibility. Mm-hmm. You know, like people. Some teams sometimes domestically teams would be beaten before they go on the field. Yeah. Because they were just so so many big characters, such a will to win, never beaten. You know, that that so many late goals and stuff like that in games. And I think the legacy of that runs probably funnily enough, nine in a row, you know, because it's like it, it's in that season where to me they 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 hate Smith. You, you, you then started to look at the season before it was a foundation one, but then you have yeah. because that season and you look and you go, Oof, this is a major manager here, you know, and 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 then I think people it wasn't the countdown to nine because I, I'm trying to think how many of that made it, but that is like I think that's five at this point. Five, I think people started looking then, right? And people started looking and thinking, right, they could probably have Smith stays around and the Goffs and the Gorums and the Brown and McCall and McCoyst and Haley, if all the 
if all the major players were, were to stay around, then people started thinking they could really do that. They could really make the name. Yeah, clinching a domestic treble as well at Parkhead with two one one over Aberdeen. They'd obviously won the league cup, beating Aberdeen as well. But Ali McCoist again is another unbelievable season. But on international duty, he breaks his leg. What was your reaction to that? Just remember, that's the night when we lost in Portugal five yeah. nothing. Yeah. And there's, there's two things that stick in my, in my mind with that. I mean, I remember obviously Koisty was in April, I think, towards the end of the season. Koisty broke his leg. Caught a tackle with a guy called Oceano Cruz, I think, and he won a great tackle. And um, but I remember Paulo Futre was the big mm-hmm. superstar. And there's one thing that sticks in my mind about that. Uh, and I liked Andy Roxburgh as a Scotland manager, but it just always staggered me that he never picked John Brown. And, and, I, and I remember that night, like, Bomber was just in the form of his life and and he didn't pick him. And I remember being totally staggered by that, you know, because it was there. And like he picked Craig Levine ahead of him and Paolo Futri tortured Craig Levine and we, we lost 5 0. And uh, I remember his quote afterwards, which for a journalist like myself was like, manna from heaven. He came out and he said, uh, a team died out there. And I, I remember kind of somewhat. Uh, Caustically thinking to myself, I may not have died out there if you put John Brown out, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I was always, you know, for, for John Brown to go through a season like that and play the way he did against top, top players, Cantona, the rest of them, and, and not be capped, to me, he was bewildering. But McCoy yeah. said he was a, a body blow at, at that point, but they got over the line, you know, like Haley carried them over the line in, in, in the other tournaments, but it's an unbelievable. Uh, Achievement, the golden boots when when you look at it, yeah, and it's just yeah. obviously he never mentions it much, eh? So. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we'll we'll get into the kind of summer of nineteen ninety three. The arrival of Duncan Ferguson is a a big one, four million pounds a Scottish transfer record. What was the what was the kind of feeling at the time? Was this a feeling like Rangers are just so far ahead and on the park and obviously financially? Yeah, I think Bolly came in that summer as well, didn't he? Yeah, was Bolly was the season after. Season after, wasn't he? So that 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 year, you look at it. When, when Big Dunk came, he was he was obviously like the talent of his generation, mm-hmm. you know. Like, and I, I think when they paid that amount of money, um, but I remember looking and thinking, well, where does he fit in? Yeah, you know, it was Big Mark, like, you know, I think they went and got him because Sir David Murray wanted to go and get him because it was it was like you know like he saw it as a statement that. Right, the biggest young Scottish players come here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, but I'm certain Walter would be behind it. But also, I was just kind of thinking the timing because it wasn't like you were looking like a Hately on the wane at that point. Hately was was still a major player. You know, he obviously always had his ankle problems and stuff like that. And I think they were maybe trying to look at uh, that as an insurance policy and maybe we'll ease Big Dunk in and stuff like that. And he'll eventually become the next Hately. But Dunk's not that type of boy, and Haley's not that type of boy. So it's like Haley's not Haley's not going to bring him on as an understudy, and Dunk wasn't going to accept being an understudy. So and then you're so now you're looking at how do you fit him in the team, and they ended up at one point, you know, like he played up front with Haley, but he played kind of off the left and stuff like that, and it just it just didn't work, you know, like and then yeah. they got himself in bother very early, which uh, made it difficult. Yeah, and obviously as well, we'll. It's a bad kind of league start, kind of three wins from nine games, those draws against Celtic, those defeats to Comarnock and Motherwell at home. But you're at the Champions League, obviously, after the the season previous, I think a lot of Rangers fans, I think even the, the man at the top will be would have been wanting to, to perform in this at this season. But Lefsky Sophia, it's a three two one at home and a two one defeat away, and Rangers go out five four on aggregate. How disappointing was that? Was that that's obviously it leads to a kind of few disappointing European results, but how big was that Lefsky Sophia defeat? Massive. Yeah, I remember, you know, I just remember again that the kind of I always felt and I and I still feel that Scottish clubs don't prepare themselves well enough for the early games in Europe. You know, there's that tradition of us that we go away and we need to have our break for a certain amount of time and and then we come back. And it always seemed as if the teams were scrambling to get themselves together in time for those games, you know, and I, even then, you know, I looked the other day and Mother will lose to Sligo Rovers, you know, how many results do we have to have like that before yeah. the teams start, start to prepare properly for early European games? And and 
that was kind of on Rangers at that time. I felt they were a bit disjointed and not quite recovered from the season before. When it was a hangover for that season. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. I think, like, you know, like, the season before had been stellar. You know what I mean? Like, it had been an unbelievable season. 44 games unbeaten, taking a lot of people, McCoy's injury, all that kind of stuff. And and then all of a sudden you're into the, the games the next season and, and the left skid is all pr- pitched up. And and that you've got to be, I think you've got to guard against that because it can hang over your whole season. Mm-hmm. No, it was unbelievable. I listened to, a, I still listen to a phone, the, the, the the, the phone ins over here on, on podcasts in Canada, and there was somebody calling for Graham and Alexander to be sacked the other night with one game. <laughs> and Motherwell, you know, and, and I remember that kind of like, uh, and I was laughing and everything when I was driving, but then I was thinking, I knew we were doing this, and I was remembering thinking back to the pressure. And I remember, you know, like, you know, Walter being questioned after that Levski Sophia game, and I'm thinking, wow, this guy's just done, won 44 games unbeaten, and, yeah. you know, won a treble, but. There you go, that's that's the pressures at range. Yeah, and then obviously it kind of picks up in the, the league rate. They go on a wee run apart from the 2 1 defeat against Celtic and kind of Lou McCarry's only. We'll touch on Celtic in a couple of minutes actually because it's there's something kind of mixes in with kind of Rangers, I feel, at this point. Rangers won the League Cup, they beat Hibs in the final. McCoy scores <laughs> obviously because back and scores that acrobatic kick. Yeah. How big was that for him and how big was that for Rangers to to get that trophy? I think it was huge, you know, at that at that point in the season. For him to come back, he was nowhere near fit. I yeah. remember that. I think he came off the bench, I think we were in 14, which would become his kind of lucky number for a little while. And, and um, some, it's just a typical McCoy school, and it? it's like Roy the Rover stuff. You know, he came off the bench, and uh, and I don't think he was quite his fighting weight. I remember uh, Stuart McCall saying to me when he landed, they made such an indentation in the pitch at Parkhead that like they had to put traffic cones in it for a while after it. And uh, <laughs> it's like yeah, it was uh, I don't think he was quite as I think people underestimate when you see when you don't know McCoy's or his body type or stuff like that. See when he was fit, Scott, he was a middleweight boxer, he's a beat, he's a beast, you know, yeah. like a, beast, a man when he was like a, he's a powerful, powerful boy when he was like super fit. But I think he would admit that uh, at that point in that final, he was kind of, again, it was like a Walter master stroke. Like, you know, he's sensing that the game's maybe turning against him a little bit. And he threw him on at the right moment to get the goal. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. And obviously Rangers go on to, to win the league as well. A 17 match unbeaten run after December. It's only three points, but obviously there's, there's five. Rangers don't win any of the last five games. But is there just this superiority at this point that there's it's it's dominance isn't it? It's Rangers are so far yeah. ahead in, in Scotland that winning the league's just the norm. Like that's yeah it was kind of becoming it was kind of becoming expected which is and also like you say Celtic were in a little bit of disarray mm-hmm. you know and uh and, and Rangers took advantage of that at, at that point. But there was also a feeling towards the end of that season I think <clears throat> ninety four that you know, it was going to be a double treble and it was it, it was kind of a cakewalk type thing and taken for granted. And obviously at the end of the season, they were limping over the line a little bit. Gorham went in a bender in Tenerife, which... Uh, was that when Walter transfer was? Yes. So, I mean, he was he badly injured at that point. He had a back injury and then they sent him out for some warm weather to try and see if there was a possibility he could play in the Scottish Cup final. Uh, and... <laughs> He then, uh, he then gave one of the great tabloid stories. You know, I remember like, like, he, he was with his wife and he was with Tracy, I think, at, the, at that point, and um, with his wife and family. They say, met the, the Oldham boys, Joe Royal and all that were there from his Oldham days in, in, in Tenerife and decided they would go for a pint with them and then meet up with the, the wife and family. One thing led to another. They never met up with the wife and family. They were flying back the next morning. He woke up at, I think, about 3 p.m. the next day, having missed his flight, uh, no passport, only got the clothes he stood up in uh, and had to phone, you know, and I got, I got a call back then and he, and I'd spoken to Walter at that point. <laughs> and he was like, where is he? You know, and, and then and he'd phone, then he phone, he'd phone me and said, well, how do you think the gaffer's going to react? I was like, how do you think he's going to react? The Scottish Cup finals coming up and you've gone missing. You know, and he, he was like, uh, and he ended up staying out there for about four days. It was a tabloid uh, 
tabloid dream that one. He was all over the front page. He's lost his passport. He finally found out that uh, his wife had left his passport at the airport and he got himself home. And <laughs> but, I mean, it was just a side show they didn't need. And then, mm-hmm. you know, when the final came, I had a wee, I had a sneaking feeling, honestly. I had a sneaking feeling just because of the way Golak was at, Un- at United. And that was a happy camp building up to, this, to the final and, and Rangers had limped over the line in the league and had the Gorham distraction and all that kind of stuff and, and what were put them on the transfer list and all that kind of stuff. And you're, you're looking at that and I'm thinking, it's not the perfect build-up to a cup final and as it turned out, they lost it. Yeah, and Rangers, are, they're going for this historic double treble. The United, the record in Scottish Cup finals at this point isn't great. Obviously, the Jim McLean fa- famous think he lost five finals and he, got, yeah. he, he leaves, he goes upstairs and they win one, but... That whole game, the obviously the big thing was the, the goal by Craig Brewster, the kind of mix up with Dave McPherson and Ali Maxwell. What mm-hmm. was the memories of that game? I honestly just remember thinking it was fated because I'd done a lot of stuff with Golak, and Golak was like one of those managers who made players feel good about themselves, you know. And they had this, I think, the United players when McLean was there. You know, that kind of, def- you know, not, not grimness about them and all that, but he had had so many misfortunes in finals. He lost the the, the classic 91 family final to yeah. his brother Tommy at Mother 4 3. And I think that just kind of that whole thing about he was cursed and all that. And then Golak came in and he was just such a happy, smiley guy. He was, uh, he was terrific, I, you know, like, and, and obviously he knew the game as well, but. And there was a lot of kind of good emerging players in that in that United team at the time. Davey Hanna, Andy McLaren, you know, good they had a good mix. And yeah. Brewster was a good striker. And they were a good team. And I just remember, I just having that sneaking feeling that it had just been not the correct build-up for Rangers and that their eyes were off the ball a little bit. And they, and they paid the price. And gave away, actually gave away a treble because it was like a, you know, it was there for them for, without doubt that day, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it leaves a... Rangers, I think they were going for eight trophies in a row. It would have been a record at the time. But let's get into what the kind of the main subject of this episode is the the culture of the media at the time and involving Rangers. Like, what was your kind of dealings like with David Murray? Like, how and at this point, like, what was what was he like? Was he like we all? I think we all have the kind of impression of Murray that he was just this colossus, this King Midas character. Was it was he like that with the media at that point? I always thought he was. I thought his dealings with the media, Scott, were really clever. If you know what I mean, because he, he'd obviously made his his fortune and uh, his business life, and he, but he loved he loved all the stuff that went with with Rangers. He loved all, all the stuff that went with being the owner of the Rangers and the chairman of Rangers, because at the end of the day, whatever great business deals he did in his day to day life, no one cared. You yeah. know, he was just making money for himself. You know, like whereas the the stuff that went with making Rangers successful. Was, was certainly uh, appealed to him, you know, and I, I think he would admit that himself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I always found him like a really fascinating guy to to deal with, and and for people that that don't like him or don't rate him or whatever, or, or look at the end of the club and and what happened with the Craig White scenario and all that kind of stuff, they should remember where the club was when he took over. You know, like you know, in eight, you know, like obviously the Soonish Revolution happened before him. But you couldn't have two people more suited to each other than Soonis and Murray. Yeah. You know, like massive characters, both got big egos, but charismatic people, you know, they and and, and I think changed changed the face of Rangers. My personal dealings with him were always excellent. You know, I always found him a, a, a really fascinating guy because when you look at his own personal journey, he came back from what he came back from. Yeah. You know, and he and you know, in the car crash and losing his legs. I mean, for, for a lot of people, that would have been it. You know, that would have been the end, you know, mm-hmm. and to battle back from that, uh, build his empire and stuff like that, I thought it was pretty admirable. You know, I think he's, uh, that gets kind of um, overlooked. You know what I mean? His personal story and the tragedies that happened to him in his life and he, and he came back from it. Uh, so I always found him fascinating, you know, and I, I always found him pretty fair. He would fall out with you. Uh, if, he, if he wrote a headline that he didn't like or he did a story that he didn't like, he'd, he'd hear about it soon enough and then you get frozen up. You know, you would get for a while. <laughs> yeah. Was it fair to say that back then he kind of had his favourites in the media, like uh, when you think of uh, like uh, Chuck Young, Jim Trainer, Graham Spears, kind of obviously before they had their kind of wee tiff. But at mm-hmm. that point, like, was it, 
the succulent lamb thing that I hate, I hate hearing about, but there's no denying it was true. Oh, there's like there's people went to to Jersey to you know, and they would have like there's nothing unusual with a football owner having a few guys out for dinner. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I've been, I've been at many, you know, I've been at many <laughs> of those, and like I had numerous lunches with Walter, you know, mm-hmm. in good restaurants and 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 also with Tommy Burns. Yeah, you know, Fergus was a, a wholly different animal. Yeah, I was, was going to touch he was, on that. He, he didn't he didn't work like that so. But like, there's there's nothing like wrong with that. But there's definitely like, you know, within the media at that point, we we would always have our fun with Spearsy or or whatever. And 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 Jim certainly had like a like a close relationship with David. But I never see. Be honest, Scott. I never like. I always thought a lot of a lot of the sniping from other members of the media was because they wanted to have that special relationship themselves because it got you stories. Yeah, so that's the same as people would say to me, and uh, I've I've heard that a million times. Or you were in Walter's pocket, or you were you were too close to Tommy Burns, or, or this that, or you know certain managers that you were you were close with. But I worked at that, you know, like I worked at that and developing those relationships. So I always thought a lot of it was like you know they can say you can say that oh he got his viewpoint put out through through those. Um, you know, those, those using those papers or using those radio stations or using that TV station or whatever way. But at the end of the day, that was kind of his job at that point. You know, he was trying to promote Rangers and he was trying to uh, further Rangers. And and I, 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 I think so, some of it, I think, slightly amateur. You know what I mean? Like, I, I find some of it, like, that's the way relationships work in the media. You know, mm-hmm. like, like I, I thought a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, you know, where people would say he had too much influence over the media, the guy that's in charge of a football team, you know what I mean. At the end of the day, you know, it was the guy who's in charge of a football club, and and those journalists they had, did they do him favors? I'm sure they did, but it happens in the, in the in the industry all over the place. Yeah, and as you, as you mentioned there, obviously, like getting an exclusive with David Murray at that point, it's it's a week's worth of papers, isn't it? It's selling your papers. I mean, like for for people that probably listen to this, you know, but back then your your newspapers, everything. I mean, we're only. Th- Four, at this point, four years away from a newspaper kind of influencing the, the election. Exactly. The election. It's, how big were the papers at that point? And he did use, he, he used them absolutely excellently. He used them for the benefit of himself and Rangers. Yeah, I think at that point, I mean, I saw both sides of it because at, at one point I was chief football writer at the Sunday Mail, mm-hmm. which was, you know, and, and, and Keith Jackson and Jim Trainer would be at the record at that point. And then uh, when I moved to the Scottish Sun, you know, at first that wasn't one of his favourite papers. But then I got on pretty well with him, you know, and we had a good relationship there. Uh, and then he, would, he, would, he was clever, Scott. You know what? He would, if he gave one to the record one week, he would give one to the Sun the next yeah. week. You know what I mean? And then that's how he, he was. He, he's an astute man. He knows how to, he knew how to play the media at that point, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then the problem then comes where I do see the problem of people being too comfortable with them and being too cosy with them was when it started to implode. Yeah. Because then you should, as a, as a proper free media, you should be asking serious questions about what's happening at the club. Yeah. And, and you can certainly make charges there of whether, you know, did the media then act correctly and ask the right questions. Mm-hmm. The difference between... Murray and Fergus McCann at this point. Obviously, Fergus McCann comes into Celtic in 1994 and you do have this thing of obviously Murray would hold court and I think it was fair to say Fergus didn't. That's obviously the thing. Like Murray, as we say, Murray, he used the media so well and at that point, I think we've, we've seen it recently with the kind of, I think there's, there's a kind of tide turned in the, the other way mm-hmm. through the media. But at that at that point, like, I mean, you, you remember... Uh, Fergus McCann getting compared to Saddam Hussein. That was just in that. It was the culture at the time. It was just weird. It's just a weird looking back on it. And you think like, was that purely because Murray gave sweeties and Fergus didn't? That it was the. I can remember sitting. I did a. I did a thing when they were rebuilding Parkhead, and Fergus and I sat at the top of the new stand, looking out over Glasgow, and we did the interview up there. And uh, the pictures. He he was a singularly unique character. Mm-hmm. You know, but the one thing that I, that I liked about him, 
And there was all that, you know, not one thin dime and all that. I mean, to be fair, I thought he was great copy, Scott, to be honest with you. Yeah. He was a Again, quite an intriguing character. Uh, I always thought he, he didn't quite understand the game in the way that Murray did. You know, yeah, I think I think that's exactly it. Media, you know, and, and, and also I thought he treated, uh, obviously, a, a huge personal link with Tommy Burns and, and I thought he treated Burns abominably. You know, I thought it was a bad decision. I thought it was a bad decision when you when you when you think that Tommy's team, possibly over the last thirty years, one of the most entertaining Scottish teams, lost yeah. one game, lost one league game and lost the league. You know, and if he if he if he'd stuck if he'd let if he'd stuck with Tommy, and and and, and just let him build something there that he was building, then you know they might not they might not have suffered the name, but like. Um, no, he was an interesting guy. And the one thing that I like about Fergus is he did everything he said he would do and then he got out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, absolutely. That seldom happens in the old firm, Scott. You know, like yeah, when you absolutely. look at the way Murray ended, his legacy is probably tainted by, in fact, it's obviously That's, tainted yeah. by what happened at the end. But Fergus's isn't. You know, mm-hmm. like Fergus, Fergus's legacy at Celtic will be rescuing them from, you know, possible, you know, liquidation. But that's the thing. Yeah, that's the thing. Like if you'd said in 95 when... He's well, maybe later than that, when Fergus is getting booed at Parkhead when they're unfollowing the flag. If you'd said then that Fergus McCann would have the better legacy than David Murray, I don't think a lot of people would have gave you. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And he probably what he, he's probably I don't know, you can always dispute the sums, but people always said to me he walked away 40 million up. Uh he walked away 40 million up having rebuilt the club and, and did what and delivered in a stadium and, and did what he said he would do. And there's, there's not many not many people do that when you look through the ownership of the old firm. So uh, definitely not. I that. Definitely. Not. The final season of we're, we're going to talk about is 94, 95. In the summer of that season, Rangers go into the European market, bring in, as we mentioned, Basil Bolly, who obviously had scored the European the fight, the goal in the European Cup final two years before. And Brian Loudrop, obviously, mm-hmm. we'll we'll touch on Loudrop a wee bit in this episode. But Bolly was a more Bolly was exciting the fans more at that point, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and for me, uh, I think like probably the the one time when my relationship with Smith almost blew up, you know, was through Basil Bolly and and the the European exit at AEK Athens, mm-hmm. uh, and that was one of those you know the start of one of those years where they had a bad week, you know, where I think they lost to Falkirk in the CIS Cup, yeah, lost to Celtic in the league and yep. lost to. Yeah, Athens in the space of one week, all at Ibrox. Yeah. And it doesn't really happen very often that, you know, like three mm-hmm. beatings in their own turf at Ibrox. And after the AK Athens game when they went out of Europe, I remember, and I spoke, I speak, uh, I've let it lapse a bit, which, like, given that I live in Canada, shouldn't be the case, but I've let my French lapse a bit. But I used to speak fluent French. I can still just about get there. If I, if I went to Quebec, I might manage. But uh, <laughs> I was, uh, uh, so it gave me an advantage to be honest in the mix zone with the other journalists if they didn't speak French yeah. I spoke Bolly and, and uh, I pulled him aside and, and he said to me uh, come out to Cameron House come to Cameron House I'll give you a story I was like oh, sure no problem thinking to myself okay no problem so I go out where he was staying one of the lodges in Cameron House uh, and he absolutely slaughtered the tactics Sla- <laughs> slaughtered you know all and it was like and that just never happened, right? When Walter was there, it never happened, you know. And it was like, yeah, uh, he said, Why am I playing right back? I won the European Cup. He played him at right fullback. Yeah. I won the European Cup uh, at centre half. I scored the goal at one of the European Cup at centre half. And I'm playing it right back, you know. And and then he said, and then then he just started on this incredible rant about why do I have to wear a tie to training? Why do I have to do, why do I have to shave? All, all, the, all the rules that were there in, in the old Rangers uh, culture. And then it was like, uh, and the tactics. And he said, what about the tactics? And that was one of those nights when he played big dunk out, out wide. Yeah. And said, we have the tallest outside left in the world. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. And I'm just like, honestly, he slaughtered it. And I was just like, and it was the early days of dictaphone, Scott. And I mean, yeah. I'm like, oh, working. You know, I'm sitting looking thinking, I hope this is working. And uh, I went back, transcribed it. And my sports editor, George Chain, uh, was I was I don't think he'd mind mind me revealing was a, a Sunday Mail at the time was a Rangers fan. The editor Jim Cassidy was a Celtic fan, so I transcribed the the quotes, 
I showed them it, and, and honestly, I knew it was it was heading for the front page as well as the back page because no one but no one broke ranks and slaughtered Walter at that point. Yeah, and I was just like, wow. I wrote it, wrote the story, and Jim Casty, who was a Celtic fan and all that, he was loving it, you know. So he was like, I'm putting it on the front, but we'll get something on the front page, we'll get something on the back page. So it went about four pages or something, you know, four, three at the back, one at the front, and uh, and Walter lost it. Walter. <laughs> And I remember my, my mistake was not listening to Ken Gallagher, God rest his soul, who had said to me, uh, if something like that's happening, you should let the manager know. Yeah. So he doesn't choke in his cornflakes, right? <laughs> and I got up, it was the old mobile phones, the half brick mobile phones. <laughs> and I got up in the I got up in the Sunday morning and I had my must have had eight missed voicemails from Walter. And the, the last one was just Answer your answer your fucking phone and all that, and he was just he was just losing it. And uh, he says, "You you better be in here Monday morning to see me. I know it's your day off because you're the Sunday papers. If you know in here, you'll never get a story of this club again and all that." And I was like, "Oh right." <laughs> so I go in on the Monday, and it's like honestly, Scott, it was like Peter the Peter the old uh, commissioner. Yeah. I remember walking in, and he Peter was shaking his head, and he's like, "It says Kingy Kingy," <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, oh here we go." I don't even remember the setup, but the gaffer's office was to the left hand side and he came battling out. You, my office. And honestly, Scott, he was shouting in my face, right? Like, and I could feel the spit all off him and all that. And he's like, Basil Bolly, Basil, fucking Bolly. He's in the door two minutes. He's you're his best pal and all that. He's blah, 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 and he's he's roaring at me, right? And I'm like, and I'm I'm kind of going down thinking, defend yourself, <laughs> defend yourself. <laughs> and I was just like, and I was like, you'll know my boss. Or so I said something pathetic, like, you'll know my boss. He said, don't you start at me. I never asked you to talk. You know, and he's shouting at me and all that. And I'm going down the corridor. He's like, right in my office. And I went and walk into his office. And he's like, he's like, in fact, I'm not even getting in my office. You're not getting in my office. You're banned. And I was like, I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, and he's like, you're banned. Go out of here. And I was like, and then I walked past. And it was usual. I actually walked past Archie. I thought Archie was actually going to physically kick me when I walked. <laughs> and he just went, and he says the same thing. He says, Basil fucking ball. You know, that, <laughs> that was it. And I went, I, I literally get thrown back out onto the street. I was, I'm, at this point, Scott, I'm 27 years old. I'm only just maybe one year into being a chief footballer. And I was saying, I'm banned here. You know, I can't go to the press conferences and all that. And of course, the gaffer thought this was brilliant. He's like, yes, we can do a story, like, get you looking all sad and all that. We took one of these pictures of you like, looking sad because you were banned and everything. And, and, and it went for like two, two, three weeks because of because of Bolly, and uh, eventually Walter brought me back in, and he did say, he said, if you if you'd had the courtesy, he said, yeah, tell me what was happening. I, I know you've got a job to do. I, I would have been fine with it, but you never. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson then. So that was me and Basil Bolly. To be honest, that was like Lovejoy never caused me any of the problems. Basil Bolly did. I I think it's quite to I think it's quick to say that Lovejoy was there. The main signing at that point, Loudrop just hits the ground running straight away, doesn't it? Unbelievable. And uh, do you know what? I really, a, a class thing about, and uh, the, the current manager, when, when he came, uh, did the same thing. Loudrop gave me his mobile on the first day he came and he never changed it. Right. Never changed his mobile phone the whole time he was there. And uh, and always took a call. And, and he came from like, Fiorentina, where he had a bad, bad time. I mean, they were going to training in the trunk of the car and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. They were in the boot and fans were waiting for them with baseball bats and stuff like that. And he had been through all that kind of nightmare in, in Serie A. And, and he just felt he came to the club and you're just like, I don't remember slight doubts about it. You know, you, it's, it's unbelievable. When you look and you think that Gascoigne was 4.3, allowed up was 2.7, I think. They came, he got Gascoigne allowed up for 7 million quid. Yeah. It's just staggering when you look at it. And Loudrop was like, Loudrop was just a fantastic player. And I think one of those things that you look at now, it's funny, I watched the game yesterday at Spurs and you watch them in the tunnel and you saw the size of the Spurs players. I don't know if you saw that it was the tunnels, they're huge. Yeah. I just remember like when we met Loudrop, I had looked at him on, on TV and thought because he had that low centre of gravity, it was quite a he was six foot one. Yeah, they called it, was it Longbody they called him? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Longbody, it's a unit. An yeah. absolute unit. And I was like, and obviously it was Harry Hollywood, wasn't he? You know, like yeah. every, the one thing I always thought about Brian was he was the one that every wife loved, right? You know, my wife would say, Who, who, who are you interviewing today? I was like, Oh, Brian loved it. Oh, Brian, you know, was like, <laughs> <laughs> he was just that, that guy, but uh, uh, oh, unbelievable player. Just hit the ground running and he was he was up there. You know, I've always got that debate about who was the greatest player you ever saw play for Rangers. 
for me it's Gascoigne, but but uh, in his peak, but but Loudrop was <laughs> Loudrop was close. Yeah, absolutely. But that 94-95 season, those two disappointing cup exits. Obviously, we touched on the European, the Champions League exit, but. 20 Rangers won 20 games that season and won the won the league by 15 points. I mean, that, if that doesn't show you just how dominant they are in the league, it's yeah. but Haley and Loudrop just obviously the they're the two special players for that season. Haley in particular just has an unbelievable season. Yeah, yeah, and I think like like that like they're just when you look at their their pedigree, they've both done it in Europe at other clubs. If you know what I mean, they both came from you know a pretty blue chip background as, as footballers uh, class act you know both of them I always found it bizarre that, that it was the strangest uh, friendship loud up and Gorham right. you know it was, like, it was like 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 just like like loved each other like just like brothers you know what I mean and 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 you couldn't get two more different guys you know like <laughs> I remember we went we went pre-season to uh, Brian's home village S- Esberg in, in, in Denmark and uh Gascoigne was there, obviously, and and Gascoigne won, I think, about a hundred or hundred and fifty quid off off Juki by betting him he could hit the ball, hit the crossbar three times out of five from the halfway line, <laughs> and he did it. And I'm sitting on a hill in this wee Danish village, Scott, in the middle of nowhere, in Loudrop, it's Loudrop's home village, and uh, the the third one he had two out of four, and the other two just missed by inches, you know, so they missed by inches, and the, the third one he flicked up. Caught it in his thigh and then he had it in the half volley and it was still rising when it hit the crossbar. And I'm looking at like from halfway and I'm looking and I'm going, oh, just like I've never seen that. This is like unbelievable. And but the level of like the, 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 I remember Brian saying to me like with, with the drinking and all that, you know, and, and it was always exaggerated that drinking culture thing, but mm-hmm. uh, a bit. But he did say to me, he's like, he was like a two two glasses of red wine with his dinner guy. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, he's like, I can't go, I can't go for dinner with these guys. I'm, I'm like, I'm done after like two drinks, you know. And and there's always that famous story he, he did, and it's true. He left the goalie sleeping one night in his wine cellar, and he always regretted that. It cost him thousands of pounds. But he left him. <laughs> goalie woke up and he's got his wine cellar. You know, it was a great, it was a great, uh, a great enduring friendship. Those two, you know, when yeah. chop. Yeah, absolutely. But the the kind of conclusion to the, the show here, what what when was kind of nine the thought of nine becoming a reality? Is it this is it the end of this season that it's becoming more and more realistic? That yeah, I think that one when it became what would it become then? It became seven then, yeah. Yeah, six, seven, yeah. I think I think six, but uh, Scott, to be honest, after the I think after like 90, 92, 93, people started kind of whispering about it, talking about it. Could this be a team that wins the nine and all that? And then when Loudrop came and Gascoigne was there as well, you know, you, you think, I think they'll always be disappointed by the lack of European impact yeah. with those players there. You know, with those players there, they, sh- they should have made more impact on Europe. But at the end of the day, at that point, nine became kind of all-consuming and mm-hmm. winning it. And I know like people will always look at you know, did they did they keep them around too long? Those players to win the ten, but their first, their major, their major mission was to win the nine. You yeah. know, like and I, th- I think at this point, then it starts to get, you know, people start winning. And you've got to remember, like, and people underestimate that now because it's twenty odd years ago or whatever. You look back and the pressure on them to win it was immense. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, like and, and, and at the end of the day, you couldn't have a bad season. You can't have like a bad start to any season. Celtic are starting to get better again, you know, like, you know, other teams are tooling up you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. There's there's a lot there's a little bit more money around in the game than, than, than there is now. And there was pressure on them in every single game, you know, to, to just to keep winning and keep, you know, and get there. And and, and you'll obviously go on in the, in the next kind of episodes like the eight and, and, and the nine, you know, like Gascoigne's, Gascoigne's influence on the eight was was unbelievable, you yeah. know, but, I think Loudrop and Haley on the seven, uh, massively important. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know I think like I think it had started building after the 92, 93, 93, 94 seasons. Then you started thinking if Smith is very importantly, if Smith stayed as manager, and if all those pivotal players like Gorham and Goff, McCall, Brown, McCoist, Janan, you know, Ian Ferguson. You know, all these players, if they were all going to stay around and, and, and then they were going to augment it with people like Loudrop and Gascoigne, then, yeah, then the nine might be on. 
Yeah. On next week's episode, we will take a look at the march towards the nine, and we will also take a look at Paul Gascoigne signing and the the impact that would have. Ian, I want to thank you immensely for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honour to re- reminisce with you about the times. No problem. Thoroughly enjoyed that again, Scott. Good to, good to speak to you again, mate. All the best. Pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to everyone that's tuned in. Please join us on the next episode of The Rangers Journey. <laughs>